suggested that we um, uh, continue the hearing and um, uh, you wanted a chance to confer with your client and yes. to see if there were any changes that they wanted to propose. Yep. Uh, and in the meantime, I've had a chance to do additional research and study uh, into the OSI manual and the zoning ordinance. So I think I've got a better understanding of what the lay of the land is, no pun intended on the law. So, um, do you want to, do you have anything yes. to add to the record? I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is FX Bruton. I'm here with Kevin Turgeon, uh, the owner of the property, and Chris Berry, uh, Berry Serving and Engineering. And uh, Chris will confirm an issue that uh, I misunderstood, so it's good that he's here because it will be helpful, I think, in terms of the concerns raised. So the gist of what we were doing again was taking two lots, agreeing to merge them, um, and then proposed a duplex. We, as I, I won't rehash everything, but we did go to the planning board and then did find it to be an appropriate location for this proposed use. So that was kind of what I look at as, in a sense, that that was a tough case in terms of not their decision, but as part of the criteria that we all need to look at, they had one of the toughest tasks. They came back with a favorable uh, position in that regard. But what I wanted to do was we, I was listening to the, to the board and I wanted to present some issues to Mr. Turgeon who was actually away uh, and then see if we could address those. And maybe we can, you know, in a more collaborative way come up with uh, the plan that might work. So generally speaking, uh, one of the issues was there's a lot going on. <coughs> but I had uh, opposed or, 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 or highlighted was that this is really a second lot would go away. This is the buffer that we would stay away from, which I think we all agree is good. What we did was a proposed driveway at the time. And if you look at the old plan, um, the old plan had um, two garage spaces and basically two driveway areas. What we did was we eliminated one of those, so we've come to a smaller uh, drive, uh, garage area, if you will, and a smaller driveway. So further decreasing uh, any impact uh, to, the, uh, to the environment. One of the other things that there was discussion about was we'd like to see a, a, a fence. So what we proposed is actually a black chain link fence that goes from the driveway all the way around the entirety of what I'll refer to as the curtilage, which is the yard. Um, it kind of blocks off the access to the other portions of the property, further cementing the kind of impact we might have to the environmental aspects of either the buffer or the wetland. The other thing I asked <coughs> the uh, client and Chris about was this proposed tree line. This is a cut to line. These are existing trees, so these would stay. Uh, and this would, again, be the yard. If you look at the aerial photo that is uh, right here, uh, there is a vacant lot in the back that does have a shed. But what exists out here is not necessarily a lot of residential use. There is residential use here. I believe there's some, uh, the owner plus maybe some renters there. This is just a uh, garage or a barn. It's not a residential use. So we don't think that we're really overburdening the area. Um, this, as I described earlier, is an existing right away. They have it through the deed. Um, so we think this is a fairly tempered down uh, version of what uh, was the original plan, which was two single-family house lots 
uh, on these two lots down to uh, this modest proposal, which uh, again is, I think, a byproduct of working with Mr. Krebs, working with the planning board, and even working with this board. Um, I'd like to make a distinction between what each board is doing, and I think the planning board is looking at this plan in terms of its appropriateness, its location, and size, and I think they did do that. Um, what the zoning board is looking at in this instance, different from your other cases, is kind of did we meet the other criteria, the other checklists, and I think we did, and I, I think the chair went through those pretty um, specifically, so I won't go through that, but all the setbacks of that um, uh, DDS subject. The one thing that Chris pointed out that was helpful to me that I didn't completely understand when I was here is there was some concern in this area where there was an elevation change. Granted, we have now the fence, but this elevation change actually doesn't go down, it goes up. So it creates a natural buffer as well. So it's not, I think the original concern was if this goes down, does someone kind of tumble down the hill, if you will? But it actually elevates and it goes up. And then again, you have the chain link fence on top of that. So we're hopeful that um, in terms of addressing what those concerns were, we've met the concerns that were raised. And again, we uh, are asking only for a conditional use permit. We're not asking for a variance, um, excuse me, special exception, I apologize. We're actually asking for a special exception, not a variance. And uh, we think that this uh, plan uh, meets all the criteria that your ordinance outlines. Um, and it also accomplishes a lot of good environmental things. Uh, taking two non-conforming lots, making them more conforming, but staying well, well, well away from uh, the wetlands and even the wetland buffer. So we appreciate the opportunity to present that. We're certainly here to answer any questions. Mr. Turgeon is, and Mr. Berry is as well. Thank you. All right. Any questions from the board? Did you have a hand up? Um, no, so Mr. Berry, you amended this plan, but I note that you didn't take the reference that the um, driveway access easement was to be provided. That's still a reference on there. That's to, re that's to remain. So that's a, an easement that we're willing to provide to uh, the abutting parties who actually use that area. Okay, so so you own the easement and you're willing to, to that's right. grant that's it correct. to the... the I assume it's this barn back here? Yeah, there are a few other users of the easement also, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that hasn't been granted to the abutter yet? Not as of yet, no. Okay. No. Keep in mind that the abutter is Mr. Poplowski, who has, by deed, the right, or he has this easement right, and he also owns these properties, so it's one person. Right. Questions from the board? So I'll propose this as a question, FX. Um, uh, I, as I mentioned at the start, I spent a lot of time with the OSI manual. Um, uh, I don't likely, like my colleagues on the board, got me really thinking over the, um, you know, over the interim while we were on continuance. Um, uh, they are smart people. They're fair-minded people. They look at the ordinance in a different way, perhaps a less legalistic way than I did, but. Um, their reaction to this was, we're putting a duplex on a single-family parcel and uh, on less than a single-family parcel for this district. Uh, and it, it, went, it got me going back to the, um, uh, to, first to the OSI, at OSI manual, which quotes the statute, which you know, governs what we do here. Um, and under 674.33.4a, um, the granting of a special exception has to be in accordance with the general or specific rules contained in the ordinance. Uh, and of course, part of what we've been, you know, going back and forth about is how closely we've come to this. But 8.1.1 of the ordinance is a special condition. So it's the land space requirements table is in Article 7, and that says you need the two acres. Um, 
and then 8.1.1 is a special condition to create a duplex or a multifamily house, and that requires a, a parcel and a half, a, right. uh, basically three acres. And it, as I thought back to the history of the um, uh, of 5.4, which is the, the special exception ordinance that we're dealing with, is I was on the planning board at the time, and as I understand or recall the, the conversations, it was uh, the owner, at before 5.4, the owner of a parcel like this could do nothing with it without a variance. They would have to prove hardship in order to do anything at all with, with the parcel. Um, and the planning board at that time looked at that and said, that's not really fair. You know, people, there are these non-conforming lots that pre-existed our ordinance. Um, forcing people to the ZBA to prove variance burdens the ZBA with, ZBA with either being too harsh or too lean, uh, too lenient uh, in granting variances. And so the, the planning board wanted to create a, a kind of a fair accommodation. Um, but I don't think the planning board intended to create a windfall for for landowners um, to do things that couldn't otherwise be done. Um, and, and so as I look at the requirements, like the, neither the planning board nor the ZBA can waive the requirements of the ordinance. Um, uh, and the requirement of the ordinance, and so as I look at 5.4, it's relief from the dimensional requirements of Article 7. Um, and it imposes the extra conditions under 11.3.4, I guess, that we've been, been citing and discussing. But I don't think that it provides relief from the special conditions. And I guess I want to give you a chance to respond to that line of analysis. Because uh, for me, it's going to change. You know, I've re last month, I was when we looked at this initially, I said, yeah, it looks like you meet all of the requirements. Um, but now I look at it, and I look at the cases um, uh, just also to give you a chance to respond. Um, in the case of a request for special exception, the ZBA may not vary or waive any of the requirements set forth in the ordinance, and it cites TID versus Alton, Precinct of Haverhill Corner, uh, and uh, New London Land Use Association versus New London Zoning Board. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that 5.4 gives, gives you some relief. Right. Um, and it gives the landowner the relief to, to build a house there. Um, but I don't know that it creates relief from the special conditions of 8.1, which says, so if you want to create a duplex, now you've got to meet additional <coughs> requirements under the ordinance. Right, so the, um, <clears throat> there's always a distinction between uh, a non-conforming lot and the setback requirements. So for instance, side, rear yard, and all that. So this meets all the setback requirements. So if you look at your conditions of uh, your special exception, it's that we meet all setbacks for the use. Mm -hmm. It doesn't talk about the land. The land is created uh, by definitions of what you use. In this zone, the duplex is permitted with a certain amount of front, uh, land. In this instance, um, this special exception is unique because it's not to vary a setback, it's to vary or to allow a building on a non-conforming lot. So if the use is permitted, but for a certain amount of size, that's when you talk about a non-conforming lot versus the uh, 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 restrictions on the use itself. So in my uh, uh, sense of looking at this, the lot size is defined, <clears throat> and if, let's say we were doing a single family, uh, that lot size would be defined as well. Uh, this is a permitted use, so it creates a nonconformity, a nonconforming lot. The special exception doesn't deal with setbacks or uh, any of these issues or septic or anything. It only deals with allowing construction on a non-conforming lot. So with this use, this becomes a non-conforming lot. So then the safety valve, if you will, is uh, knowing that this is a non-conforming lot for this intended use, do you meet everything else? For instance, in the uh, 
requirements. Do you meet the setbacks? Yes, we do. Uh, do you meet the other requirements? Water and sewer. Do you meet the other requirement? Go to the planning board and make sure it's an appropriate location for this use. This is the use that was proposed. It wasn't single family. Keep in mind a broader context. This is two lots. We're, I think, in collaboration, and maybe the adage of no good deed goes unpunished. We're taking those and saying, we'll put these together. But they are existing non-conforming lots. We're trying to make them more non-conforming. Less non-conforming. Non I mean, excuse me, uh, less. <laughs> more conforming. More <laughs> conforming, that's what I meant to say. Right. So um, that's how this ordinance deals with this type of special exception. You can have special exceptions for other things. This one allows a permitted use where you don't have enough lot size. That's what this request is all about. We want to do a permitted use on a piece of land that isn't big enough, according to the ordinance. That means it's a non-conforming lot for that use. Uh, so this request is because we don't conform to that. But in doing so, it asks to make sure that you conform to setbacks, water, health, safety, all those things that I think we've proved we can do. And again, I again I reflect on the planning board looking at and being charged under your ordinance with that determination that this is an appropriate location for that use, which they did. And they unanimously decided that it was. Thanks for your response. Other questions from the board? Where I gave the applicant an opportunity to put ex uh, additional evidence and comment into the record, are there any abutters uh, or residents that want to uh, provide additional in insight or input to the board? Sure. And if you could just state your name. Okay. Tony McClendon. Mr. McClendon. Uh, how many units per side? Has that been determined yet? It's a duplex. So two families, one family for each how side. How many bedrooms per side, roughly? Two bedrooms for each side. It's a two okay. Or three. I mean, I get what they're trying to do. Uh, <coughs> the town rolls for if there's children living there, have to pay for the schooling, where the owner just makes money off the property. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I want that, I'd like that to be brought up also. Pardon me, I'm a little nervous, but... Take your time, that's all right. But, uh, it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, inherited property. This is something they bought recently. We knew the zoning, two acres. I just don't feel it's appropriate to uh, put a duplex there. Thank you, Mr. Other comments or input from the public? I just want to add that when we were considering the two single families, the direction from that planning board and Mr. Krebs was to try and focus on a duplex. So I'll go back to my adage of no good deed goes unpunished. We're trying to take two lots that have constitutional rights and merge them into one lot. We're making a better situation. We can go back to the drawing board and look at what we can otherwise do. It wasn't this applicant or this owner, but <clears throat> I know there was plans for some potential commercial use at one point. I think it was storage or maybe it was something else. And I was reminded, I think, by the applicant that the planning board or whatever board it was suggested that this should be residential use. So this is a dovetail of a lot of effort to do what the town was looking for. Um, it's not an overburden. Uh, these are 1,120 square feet. That's 2,200 square feet of housing. This is combined less than a, sing a typical single family house that we've built, particularly in Rollinsford. These houses are now built 25, 27, 3,000, 3,500. 
This is 22,000 square feet of living space. This is an effort by, the, by an applicant coming to you to say, I'm trying to respect what the town otherwise wants. The town wants you to stay away from the wetlands. The town wants you to stay away from a generous buffer. The town wants you to get the ES approval. And this is a modest plan. You could look at it and say this is not, but you'd have to tell me that 2,200 square feet of living space is, is overburdening what really is two legal lots. I don't think it is. I don't think that's reasonable. Um, I think this plan is reasonable not only because it looks reasonable, and it probably, and I think it is, um, but it's the suggestion of uh, a lot of input from the town. So I, I again think that the relief that's being requested is to allow us to build on a non-conforming lot. To do that, you have an unusual process, one that doesn't exist in other towns. You send us to the planning board for their reasoned, considered uh, opinion on that. You unanimously have suggested that this is reasonable. That carries a lot of weight, in my opinion. And um, it was a bigger project, in essence. It was uh, a bigger garage and a bigger driveway. So we really are uh, scaling it down from what was originally proposed as requested. They're the ones that make that determination. You make kind of other ones. I, I look at this as you look to see that our setbacks are met. We have water supply. Um, we have all that. We have septic. That's going to be DES approved. We, we, we meet this. Uh, buffer, that's another thing you look for. The other thing you added was things as a courtesy we listened to and we put on the plan. Chain link fence, uh, a, a buffer line for the trees, uh, a smaller unit. We did that. So if we can't get an approval because we listened to everything, not only you, but the planner and the planning board asked us to do, I don't, I don't know how that could be considered reasonable. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bruton. I have something to say. Um, with all due respect to the planning board, I certainly, if I was sitting on that board, I would never have approved this because I don't think it's a proper use of the land. I, I'm very concerned with the fact that we're taking two non-conforming lots and making it a larger non-conforming lot. Well, it's less and, conforming. Well, I mean, more it, conforming, excuse me. It's a little more yeah. conforming, but it still is it's only half of what we require in that area well, for a single family I don't mean to home. interrupt you, but you'd be surprised what is out there for non-conforming lots. Um, this is not, uh, you're not ending up with a postage stamp. But go to this community and other communities, and they're called postage stamp lots. And they're non-conforming, and they're allowed to be built on. Uh, you didn't want to know what they do in Portsmouth, but well, even... Uh, yeah. Well, all due respect to you, yeah. um, Mr. Milton, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but if we can't really compare ourselves with Portsmouth. I'm, I'm referring to land here as well. Okay. Uh, we ha I'm sure we do have a lot of non-conforming lots, and we'll take them up as the board or whatever will pick them up at the appropriate times. However, when we're talking about this one, the egress onto Oak Street is less than sufficient, in my opinion. You have um, two built two <clears throat> two family home there, with the potential of having four additional cars coming out onto Oak Street. It's a horrible street to begin with. You're right near the railroad trestle. If there was an accident with people coming out there in the, in the winter and stuff, where are they going to go? I mean, it, there's. It's I, I can respond to that. Um, this. Access driveway has been used repeatedly by uh, the other people who have rights to it mm -hmm. without incident that we're aware of. And, you know, uh, this, this consideration is really not in front of the board. And I understand what you might have said if you were on the planning board, but they have unanimously said this is an appropriate location for the use. And I'm not trying to say that to kind of stifle anyone. 
we listened to what they said mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, this make this smaller, let's go over the fence. We've done that. So I'm not saying, hey, forget it, we're not listening to you. In fact, the opposite, we did. Um, but if I look at it kind of in context, they're over here doing what they did, and this board is charged with looking at the other criteria that we think we've met. So I think the applicant is doing that with due respect not only to this board, but to the planning, with the planning board, and came up with a really good plan. Again, this, this has been used, this has been in existence for decades without incident, and so I... And what's the traffic light on, like on that um, right away now? What is... Well, I drive it. It seems to be okay, but, you know, I mean, I'm not supposed to be doing a traffic study for a special exception. So the criteria, you know, for and this case... I drove case, down that road mm -hmm. and several times this past mm -hmm. month to find out what it was like. Mm -hmm. The traffic is very heavy. Um, there's very little chance of stopping, especially at this point, if somebody is pulling up in front of you, because there is a slight curve there. I'm worried about what it would be like in the wintertime with the snow banks. The railroad trestle is not far from there. There's no place for people to go if someone goes. The railroad like, trestle? You mean the railroad the, line? The, no, the, the bridge. bridge. The bridge is not far from there. Well, what, I mean, does that affect traffic? It's just well, the road. I know, but I mean, it, they, it's not like they can pull over. I mean, if somebody pulls out, there's like very little chance for someone to pull over. Well, actually, I disagree. I think the visibility is excellent here. And I think I if you... I find that to be true. Well, yes. nonetheless, I yep. mean, it's not while we're here. I mean, I'm not trying yep. to be flip about it either. Yep. It's just not while we're here. Well, I, I think it's a safety concern. I think, I think it's a very big concern. safety concern, and I, I, I'm not in favor of that. traffic study. Um, well, if I may. So, um, if that's asked, a lot of traffic study. So I'll tell you what the traffic study would say. And it's this type of housing, and I wanted to mention this a little bit earlier in, in FX's presentation. When we originally looked at, let's just take a step back. When we really originally looked at that, we have two two lots of record. So by general right, we would have two single family homes. Um, two single family homes from a if you look at a snapshot of, of housing today, uh, they generate more children, they generate more traffic uh, from the ITE standpoint um, than the proposed uh, housing stock that we're, we're showing here. And there's a reason for that. Um, most people that move into this style housing stock versus two single family homes are a generation different. So my generation and younger, we are looking for this type of housing um, we either have one small child or no children, and by the time that we have more and we're stepping on more Legos and kicking more blinking, dancing toys, we want to move to a single family home. So, and, and the discussion with the planning board was mostly uh, impact of land, but I think inadvertently we got to a housing stock that generates in, in total less children, less actual human behavior and impact on the land, but to your question specifically, less traffic. Um, the ITE manual says that on average a single family home generates about 9.4 uh, vehicle trips per day. Um, on average, a duplex or townhouse style uh, structure uh, generates far less than that. It's about five um, trips per day. So. Uh, to your point, we're actually generating less uh, trips to and from Oak Street than we would if we had the two single family homes. Now, I understand that the consideration is what happens when you're sitting here looking left or right. And the other thing that we find is that there's a progression in how traffic moves. So traffic on Oak Street will uh, likely move uh, to and from the, I guess this is uh, east and west. And so we'll, those type, that type of traffic is trying to find the closest corridor to, in the morning uh, to work and in the afternoon from work. And so uh, what you're going to find is in this particular location that there's kind of a split. 
Um, I would think that most of the uh, traffic in the morning is actually going to be heading east so that we can head down to uh, 4 and then down to uh, Portland Street to jump on the highway. Um, but then you'd have a, a probably a 40% split that would head to uh, Broadway uh, for the same reasons. Um, so as you're sitting here and you're generating maybe one or two trips from the total development in the morning, one of those trips is going to head left and one of those trips is going to head right. In the afternoon, uh, there's a much larger derivation of when people come home. Um, but most people, uh, when they're uh, approaching home, uh, would pick a route on their way uh, back to their project site or back to their home uh, that would require more right-hand turns than left-hand turns for the very reason that you're discussing. Um, so traffic in a lot of ways uh, is like water. It finds its equilibrium. And so if you are a resident here and you find that because Broadway and 4 um, are essentially the easiest path and equal path to and from your destination, uh, you would likely take 4 back to the project, uh, our project site, so that you could take a right-hand turn into the, into the site. Uh, when we're looking at uh, general safety, uh, there's no uh, large uh, grade change between here and the bridge. As you're uh, sitting in the driveway, you can see well across the, the full top of the bridge. And then there's a distance well beyond the next driveway as you're looking to the east. As you're traveling to and from and along the corridor, there's open sight distance along the, the corridor also. And there's a large open area here at the front of the site for your left and right hand turns. So, um, Though we haven't done any, you know, an actual traffic study, as FX pointed out, uh, that's something, not something that we would really look at doing as part of a project like this, um, but we do have quite a bit of experience in that area. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Other questions from the board? I, I just want to, maybe I'm going over something that is a basic question that I'm getting more confused as it goes along. Tony so, Bruton, can you answer this for me? If, if your client wanted to, could he build two single-family homes on those two non-performing lots? Um, the ordinance does uh, say, as we, as we are here for this project, that if they're non-conforming, that we would have to go uh, to get a special exception for both of those uses as well. Okay. And by the way, that's how we started. And we were asked to kind of go in this direction. And that's, to me, the hardest part of this. That's what we were originally asking, Mr. Travis. And I don't want to. Um, so the, the board is burdened um, by this public deliberations um, aspect, and I don't. I don't resent having to deliberate in public, but it, it's very difficult for us as we're learning our way into this ordinance and into this process. Uh, and I want to make it as comfortable as I can for, um, like if Mr. Hinsman and I are struggling, uh, my colleagues on the board are, are also struggling. They're working hard to understand a very complex set of zoning laws at the state level and zoning ordinances at the local level uh, and overlay it onto, onto land use. So um, at the risk of, I don't want, I, at some point I need to bring this hearing to a close so we can deliberate. Um, but for the other members of the board, do you understand um, this conversation we're having? The, Mr. Turgeon buys two parcels of land. He could, neither parcel of, of land is a conforming lot. Right. So the owner of lot A and lot B could come to the to this board and ask for a special exception, pick Mr. Turgeon and Mr. McClendon, right? They can each come into the board and ask for a special exception to build a house on lot A and lot B. Except it's not large enough according to the... That's right. why you're asking no, for a special that's, exception. That's why they that's can have a special purpose. exception. Yeah. Those, they're not... But I don't... But they, yeah, have to meet. I, they have to meet certain I'm sorry. criteria. I, that's a special exception. They have, to, they have to meet criteria for the special exception but those criteria are set back and get us to get out, get water and get um, right. So the, meet the setbacks backs without encroaching on wetlands, etc. And, et and there should be a well. Safety. Eventually, they can get. They need to get a variance. You, the, unless the town buys the parcel, mm -hmm. it can't say to a landowner, "You can't use the parcel." Right. Okay. Um, and so what Mr. Bruton is explaining is that 
they came in originally to get two separate houses. And they talked with Mr. Krebs, who encouraged them to merge the lots and look, instead of building two different houses, to build a single duplex on the, on the parcel. So that's... So a plan was presented to the planning board for two separate homes. There was actually a plan. I'd like to see that. Do you have that, Mr. Berry? Did they pass it? No, I no. don't. I don't have that with me. didn't pass it. I did. It was a concept. It was, uh, but no, a plan it, was provided. It was, it, was, with... it was much further along than a concept. Um, so the existing boundary lines here and uh, we showed a, a single family home here that met setbacks, mm -hmm. a sewage uh, disposal system uh, up in this area here. And then <clears throat> this lot uh, has a front setback like this, and we were proposing a structure uh, that sat something like this, and a driveway that came uh, in this area here. And then we were proposing a sewage disposal system out, outside the uh, required state setback. So um, what this did is uh, we went to the planning board essentially for two topics. Uh, we were asking for a special exception, um, and we knew that they needed to weigh in on a special exception. But also uh, we were asking the planning board for what's known as a conditional use permit. And when you are encroaching inside of the buffers in, in the town of Rawlingsford, the planning board gets to weigh in on whether you're doing that appropriately and you meet certain criteria there. And so uh, when we got to the planning board, um, essentially we were asked if we would consider smashing these together and doing the development outside of, outside of the uh, lower section and that would uh, compact the project site and uh, reduce overall impact um, as we've demonstrated. Um, so it was much more than a concept. We you know, we spent quite a bit of engineering time on uh, making sure that something like that was viable. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Is it recited somewhere? I don't see anywhere noted on here that these are uh, two bedroom dwellings. In, in the petition that they sent to us, it said two to three. Bedrooms. Yeah, it did say two to three. Two to so three bedrooms. Well, as a condition of approval, we can certainly agree that they should be limited to two Then we can add it to the plan. Other questions from the board? No? Mm -hmm. Mr. Hinsman. Uh, I have a question, Charlie. I, I, uh, is doing my thinking aloud here. So I am a less sure of uh, myself than when I came in here. When I came in here, I thought that um, my understanding was, with a special exception, if you, uh, with a non-conforming lot, you ask for the waiver of the setbacks. And if the uh, it was otherwise a permitted use, and it met the water and sewer, then the real issue that the board is identifying for me is 11322, which is the public safety of the uh, of the you know the entrance into the ingress and egress. But you brought up something, and I was looking over your shoulder and read it, which confuses me a bit because what you were reading to me seemed to indicate that. Um, we could look, if you would, almost a little bit beyond this, and you were talking about whether or not uh, what you were reading the OSI indicated that this had to meet the requirements for duplex as well. So I, I'm sort of caught up on that and confused by that. So I mean, so that's what I'm hung up on. Is uh, yeah. that was my struggle, John, from the last meeting. You know, when I had done my research that 8.1.1 was not being met, that it's essentially, they are taking new two non-conforming lots, but in my mind, it, it is becoming a, a more non-conforming lot because of the duplex itself. Um, in Rollinsford, a, a lot, if it's a duplex, one and a half times 
the land plus 300 feet of frontage. Um, so I was hung up on that as well, and, and that I still see that as a as an issue as well as safety. Um, I do think the safety is, is a concern. Um, with all due respect to Mr. Barry, you speculated about the traffic. Um, I've lived here for 27 years. I'm well aware of the traffic on Oak Street. It's very intensive. Um, it's not just two times a day. That, that is a very highly traveled road. And um, the uh, Jersey barrier, I'm not sure what the term is, um, it, it goes right to where this driveway is going to be. So visually, um, viewing to the right is very difficult um, to see oncoming traffic because there is a, a, a crest to the bridge um, and the approach to this driveway and then it drops down. So I do have concerns regarding safety um, and I, I do believe they are very valid concerns. Can I also agree with that? Um. I don't think I have anything to add. I, um, like Mr. Hindi, I'm conflicted about how 8.1 applies. Um, Do you want to make any final comment, Mr. Bruton? Why don't you make that point? Because you're, you have the expertise. That sure. So the, the discussion here at the board is, is the overall impact. And so if, we, if you were to make a distinction between a, a single family home on this lot versus a duplex, from a traffic safety standpoint, this is almost equal to that. So if, you, if, if we were to look at, if we just looked at one lot and we, did, and we asked for a single family home on the front lot, on an average daily basis, the traffic impact from one single family home is about the same as what we're proposing here. So I understand your point that I speculated because I don't have, I haven't run traffic numbers. I, I don't have traffic counts. But I was on the survey field crew that stood in this intersection and witnessed the vehicles coming through here. So it's not that I have never been to this site before. I also travel this to and from meetings here at the town uh, on a regular basis. So um, I do understand this site and I do understand uh, this intersection. And I'm, and I'm not downplaying the, the, the total volume that is on Oak Street itself. Um, but I guess from a, a traffic standpoint and a safety standpoint, the number of trips coming to and from this proposed duplex versus a single family home is almost identical. Thanks. And Mr. Barry, I'm, I'm going to um, wade in just a little bit. The board does defer to your expertise in terms of you know about on average how many trips in and out of a duplex there are during a day. And I don't think the board has special expertise. I think that I think that what Ms. Rollo and Ms. Cass are talking about is the traffic on Oak Street, and I'm not sure that we've been clear that, that part of their concern is about the, and I don't want to read into it, but my understanding is that they're concerned about the heavy traffic on Oak Street, mm -hmm. not so much on your ability to speak knowledgeably about the number of <coughs> daily, average daily trips in, in and out of the two things. Um, but the, and we appreciate the clarification. Thanks. Um, and I want to be fair to everybody, give everybody a say uh, before we close the, the public hearing and go into deliberations again. Ready? So, uh, Mr. Turgeon, Mr. Bruton, Mr. Berry, thank you. Members of the public, thank you. Well, this closes the public hearing. We're in public deliberations. Um, I believe there was a motion um, on the floor at the time that we... Um, uh, recessed uh, a, a motion on the floor to um, deny the application. So um, I don't think that motion has been withdrawn. I think it's it's back on the back on the floor. So um, we're in deliberations. Anybody have any comments?
Um, well, what I come back to is the fact that we have non-conforming lots and we're looking for variance, right? No, we're looking for a special exception. Well, a special exception. Um, and it seems that uh, our rules for duplexes don't really fit into this either. I'm still confused on 8.1, and uh, but I'd like to hear what other people say. And the board hates me, I think, because I wait. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I'm fine. I, I've pretty much made it in so I have nothing I further want to, to be say. Deferential to the other yeah, members of the board. So. Yeah, I understand. Do you want to go, or do you want me to go? Go ahead. All right. So, uh, as, like Mr. Hinsman, I'm going back and forth about 8.1. I think what changes my mind back again um, is the fact that it is two lots that are being joined. So, under the, under the ordinance as I've known it for 30 years or so living here, the owner of a parcel, the, the town can't deny the owner of a parcel a reasonable use of the parcel. And... Um, and, in, and if we were meeting this on a variance request, two separate owners of those two separate non-conforming lots would have very strong cases for a variance because they would, like the, the basic paradigm for local zoning is to build a house on a piece of land if you, if you own the piece of land. And whether you're, um, and, and here I do part company from some people in town, you'll, I hear people say, you know, developers aren't entitled to the same rights as a private landowner, and that's just not the law. The law is we treat Mr. Turgeon fairly, we treat somebody who's lived in this town for 80 years fairly. The same laws apply, the same rules apply. We can't discriminate against Mr. Turgeon because he purchased it to make, you know, an economic decision. Um, and so, even though I disagree with Mr. Bruton, the this isn't a this isn't a special exception for a use. This is a special exception on dimensions. Um, the use of a duplex is permitted in the countryside residential, but the, the the that particular use is subject to the special condition in 8.1. Um, and I I am not convinced that entirely that we have the right to waive that. Um, but I'm also convinced that, that I'd much rather see this development than see two separate standalone single houses um, on two different parcels there. And the landowner has that right. The, the, unless this town is ready to buy the land from them, um, um, this town can't tell a landowner not to use their land. Um, uh, that's not what the old ordinance was there for. So on balance, reluctantly, um, I would vote to grant this, um, not because I agree with the use argument, but because I would defer to the planning board's finding that that not enforcing the 8.1 in this particular circumstance is better than having two detached single-family houses on those parcels. So sorry for the long explanation, okay. but there it is. Ms. Rob, go ahead. I am not voting for it. That's it. Ms. Cass. Um, I'm struggling with this, as, as you all know. Um, I'm of the belief that if the applicant um, could do two single-family homes on these parcels, he would. Um, I'm hung up on the safety concern. Um, for me, that's a big sticking point. Um, I don't think that they have met that requirement of the special exception. I, I mean, I, I, I do think that it is detrimental. Um, I do agree that the decreasing... It, I'm actually leaning a little more towards granting it. However, I, I would be 
um, remiss to not say that I would want the um, two bedroom limitation and also a height on the fencing. Um, I also think it's a safety concern with that slope. Um, again, I'm familiar with the property. The slope does go down to the railroad tracks. Um, so I guess I, I'm looking for some guidance from my fellow members to maybe push me a little more towards that, but um, I guess I can be convinced that. It's a, truly a safety issue. Right. Mr. Hinsman. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against, by the way, voting against my vote um, on the planning board. Um, I think that this pro, you know, uh, Charlie, you and I are in Attorney Bruton here in uh, law, which the adversarial process brings out truth, and I think that this has been much more, he's been much more fleshed out here than in the planning board. Um, having said that, um, we had a very experienced planning board, technical advisor by the name of John Krebs, who this past muster with, and I put a lot of faith in his um, expertise. I did look at the house on the other side of the trestle. Um, that's a similar distance in my mind. Uh, it's a single family home that was built not too long ago. The home was damaged to the street. Um, it probably has a little bit better visibility because you're not coming down the hill, mm -hmm. but I'm not aware of any accidents there. Um, and so while I am not uh, excited about this, um, I'm looking at that unless someone can convince me that 8.1 applies, that I am going to reluctantly vote in, in, in a, to approve the uh, special exception. That's where I'm, I think I've settled out tonight. Well, I'll give you a chance to weigh in on safety. I, um, I guess, Andrea, what I would say on safety um, is I do understand the concern that Oak Street is congested, particularly sometimes a day, that would make that um, difficult. What I, um, I am, I would be relying on, on Mr. Barry's representations that. Um, a duplex generates fewer, um, let's see, one duplex generates fewer average daily trips than two single family houses would. Um, uh, I, I think in terms of sight line, um, I, I, think every, I think everybody has raised good concerns just from the standpoint that I think <coughs> you and Ms. Rollo have emphasized that there's a lot of traffic there. It sometimes moves fast. It's sometimes hard for somebody, particularly in a hurry, coming out of that um, um, throat, uh, driving throat. Um, it, it could be it's a, it can be a little dicey, particularly if you have to get across track. On the other hand, um, from the safety standpoint, I'm persuaded that um, the applicant really has done a nice job. Um, we appreciate I appreciate um, their effort. You know, we were worried about the access to the railroad. There's a fence. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we were worried about some other um, characteristics of the parcel, and they changed their design to meet some of our concerns. And so from that standpoint, I am persuaded that it is about as safe as they could make it and that they listen to our concerns carefully. I agree about the fencing. Um, so I, I guess that's where I come down on safety. Um, I know that leaves us with the... It, it, it does leave us with, with the, as Mr. Hensman calls it, a, an unhappy choice. Um, it, the, the proposal doesn't thrill me, but it's I like it better than two single-family houses. I guess it's, I'm sorry, I can't be more persuasive. Um, Ms. Rollo, do you want to weigh in on safety? No. I'm yeah. um, Does Ken have anything? Do you have anything? On safety, no. Okay. So I think we're ready for a vote. The motion is to deny. Um, and so um, if that motion fails, we can consider a motion to grant. But um, the, the, the question, so a yes vote is to deny the application. A no vote is to we'll stay and talk some more about whether or not there's a way to uh, grant official, uh, grant, uh, grant the special exception. So uh, are we ready for the vote?
Again, Charlie, explain the yes and the no. A yes is to yes deny. Yes is to deny. Okay. And no is to, um, you know, we could at that point entertain a motion to approve it with conditions. Does everybody understand how we're, what we're voting for? So those in favor of deny, um, please say aye. 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 And those opposed to denying, please say no. And I would be a no. I'm a no. Okay. So um, the motion to deny fails. Um, and so now we would need a motion to approve. Um, and is there somebody who would make that motion? I make a motion to approve with conditions. Okay. Um, I, I would like to there to be a height on the fencing um, that's noted. I think it's six feet. Is it six feet? That's that's on. I thought you said four feet. So I'm I'm comfortable with the six foot fence. Okay. And the two bedroom limit. And the two bedroom limit. Correct. Correct. I will pause. Second the motion. Unless someone else wants to add conditions. So um, we are in discussion on the, on the motion to approve, uh, and again, I wanted I don't want to be premature, but we hashed it out. Ms. Rowley, anything nope, you'd like? Done. You got it. I'm done. Ms. Cass, I'm good. Good. So we're ready for a vote. A yes vote to approve with conditions is just that. It approves with condition, and a no vote um, is to deny the. Uh, deny the special exception. Those in favor of the motion to approve signify by saying aye. 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 And no. those opposed? No. No. So the, uh, by a vote of three to two, um, and we'll get an order out to, to summarize what we've done. And we um, do appreciate everyone's considered efforts in a significant case. Certainly appreciate everyone's input. Thank you. I, I want to thank the board. Uh, I know that we've worked hard on this one. I appreciate everyone's willingness to hang in there on it. Thank you, members of the public, and uh, Mr. Turgeon, Mr. Berry, and Mr. Bruton. Thank you all. That, I'll take a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Second. And it's non-debatable. Those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All right.